Yes. I think so, yes. Can you hear me? Right. Okay. Right. Yes, there are a lot of people there. <laughs> And I see there are also about 40 people online. Uh, you're getting feedback from somewhere. <laughs> Shall I turn my microphone off? There still seem to be mysterious noises, but perhaps they will stop. <laughs> Thank you. 
There is still this strange background noise. Oh, it's less now. <laughs> I would like to introduce the speaker of today's lecture, Professor John Baines. He's Professor Emeritus at the University of Oxford. He has been a professor at Oxford since 1976 and is one of the leading figures in Egyptology in our time. 
His principal areas of interest are Egyptian literature and visual arts, religion and spirituality, self-presentation, and modeling culture in a specific social context. But also, his research interests extend far beyond Egyptology, into the fields of anthropology, social sciences, and interdisciplinary Recording studies. in progress. She created a bridge between Egyptology and other humanities, introducing researchers from other fields of knowledge to ancient Egypt and Egyptologists to theoretical achievements of other disciplines. The topic of his lecture is devoted to the art of ancient Egypt and the pictorial representation. This is an extremely interesting topic, the interest in which has been growing in recent years. I will give the word to Professor Baines, and all of us we will enjoy his immense knowledge of ancient Egypt and Egyptian culture. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I can't tell whether you can hear me or not. Uh, I'd just like to say at the beginning that I will have to go very fast in this lecture. And so uh, people can ask during the question session at the end if things are not clear, or perhaps things will become clear as we move forward. Uh, the first picture here is just to emphasize that Egyptians created extremely complicated compositions which cannot possibly be understood in a literal way. And one of the problems that Egyptian art poses for us is that it's easy to think that what is shown is literally depicting something, almost as if ancient people had a camera. And that bias that people have come with to the art often has created problems. So I hope that I can suggest ways around that sort of difficulty. I can't comment on that picture, which is far too rich for that now. And I will give you another initial uh, example, plus a few cases, um, related cases before we get to the main topic. And so here is a quote from a famous uh, modern artist who is emphasizing the problems address, uh, created by cameras, by taking photographs. Photographs can do one thing, and most of them only one thing, although with computers they can do more than they used to. Uh, paintings are have things with more potential and many different ways of doing things. And here is the example of the type of issue that people have. Uh, that donkey there, which has been reproduced quite a lot, has two baskets. Now, is one of the baskets above on the donkey's back, or is it round the back of the donkey so that we wouldn't actually see it in nature? If the second answer is correct, then that exemplifies what Hockney says. But um, it's possible there will be another explanation. We'll come back to that. Here is an example of the type of picture which cannot possibly be taken literally. In this case, um, two statues are receiving a, um, incense while they are being transported towards the tomb. Part of the composition is in it was painted, and you can see the stripes, which indicate that the shrine is made of wood. But the stripes are not literally applied, they're applied a bit arbitrarily. And the two men are holding hands. But, of course, you can't really have two standing wooden statues holding hands. So that tells you something about the relationship of the men, but it doesn't tell you anything about what the statues might have looked like. And here is another example from the same tomb. 
Uh, and in this case, the statues are also receiving incense and uh, and aromas through flowers. And it, these are seated stone statues shown in a completely different way. And that is because the function of a statue of stone is important. But we shouldn't think that this, this either is going to be a very literal way of understanding things. And here is an example of the type of issue that people have often discussed. What is happening, particularly on the right here? Uh, you have a set of sandals, five of them, and then you have a square. Some people said that square is a window in a wall, but I don't think it is. Then you've got a man working on one of the sandals, exactly the same in appearance as the ones on the wall, and, or probably not on the wall, and come to that in a moment, and the one to the right doing something a bit different. Uh, the tools that the left-hand man uses are above him, and the right-hand man's tools are in front of his legs. Uh, now, the, it's impossible to take this one literally either. Basically, what is shown, I think, is that there, we have these two men, they have their tools, and the pro products from which they will make the sandals around them. And the square object is probably a piece of leather, which will be made into a sandal. It's not a window. And so in this case, the picture surface is used to add elements which could not otherwise be fitted conveniently. It's particularly clear, I think, on the right, where those tools uh, couldn't possibly be in midair as they appear to be. Uh, a different case on the left, where if you were to try to say where the stick that this sleeping man or sleepy man um, is keeping uh, runs, it would be impossible. But what you can, can say is that he wants to make sure his, his stick stays with him. But the compromises that are involved in representation are not um, restricted to ancient Egypt, of course. And so here we have a very famous Western painting. And this is done in central perspective with all the tools of a Renaissance artist. Uh, it is the work of Raphael in the Vatican. Uh, and the, we have a geometry lesson, and you have two pictures of it. One is somebody is holding up a sphere, and there's a second sphere just next to it. And then below, people are looking at geometry on a, uh, on a, a slate uh, plate. But if you look at those uh, spheres, they are truly spherical, as we would look, view them, but they're not in the center of the picture. If you were to use central projection and draw lines from the vanishing point or the, from the central point of the picture, then those uh, spheres would look like eggs. But of course, we don't think that spheres do look like eggs. They think that must, we think that would be strange. So again, there is a compromise in this representation. And so the Egyptians are doing similar things, but they're doing them within a different set of conventions. Sorry, that's just highlighting the, the slate thing at the bottom. And there is the picture. And so the fundamental work on Egyptian representation is this work of Heinrich Schäfer, first published in 1919 in this rather beautiful edition. And you can tell that Schaeffer did not take things literally if that was the cover he chose. Um, and so it, it's nice to see that and to realize that he already was thinking in terms of design, which was then conveyed to the designer of the book. Now, I, early in my career, translated Schaeffer's book into English, and that's the cover of the um, printing of it from about 2002, if I remember right. Um, that's very heavily revised from what Schaeffer published in 1919. It, the last edition was 1963, last German edition. But we can go also to other traditions and think how they can help us think about ancient Egyptian representation. So uh, here is Asterix and Cleopatra. 
uh, which was famous when I was a student. I don't know if people in Bulgaria still read Asterix, but it is set in Egypt. And it, what I'm thinking about here is mainly the organization of the images. So they are in registers and they are divided one from another, depending on the amount of space a topic needs. Uh, and all sorts of conventions that you find <coughs> in um, uh, in comic strip can be closely paralleled with ancient conventions. <coughs> These are, I think, much more universal than the conventions of uh, of uh, perspective. And uh, there is a joke in this uh, sequence. There is Cleopatra and an Egyptian artist has brought uh, his work, his picture of her, for her to see. But she doesn't like it because uh, it isn't in perspective, because Greeks used perspective, or more or less they did. <coughs> Excuse my coughing. Uh, whereas the artist says... Uh, uh, you know what I think of modern art. So from his perspective, he does uh, traditional ancient Egyptian art. And uh, there are lots of quite interesting little points in uh, Asterix and Cleopatra. Uh, I would also mention this book by Scott McLeod about how to understand comics, which I think tells you a lot. He starts with ancient Egypt. I just put in a Chinese example here to emphasize that Egyptian art is fundamentally representational, which is why we have these problems of understanding. If you take these Bronze Age Chinese objects, the left-hand one can't be really said to be representational at all, and the right-hand one is a tiny bit representational. It's got these two figures just below the rim, which are dragons. But of course, dragons don't exist in the world, as far as we know. And so uh, that is a, an imaginary form of representation. But you can have major artistic traditions which are not interested in reproducing anything in the world as it appears, um, whereas the Egyptians clearly were interested in that. And that's why modern interpreters have problems. Uh, here is another tradition, uh, Central American, where nobody would think, particularly if we take that detail there, that uh, this is anything like a literal representation. Yet they do do that sort of thing for Egypt, and that's where our problems lie. So uh, I'm trying to go fast, so there'll be time for discussion afterwards. Um, and I put this heading here to remind you that many ancient pictures were not really intended to be viewed. Uh, a high proportion were walled up in tombs. They might have been viewed for a um, short time before the tomb was completed or during the process of completion. And uh, others, it would never have been seen. If you take the famous mask of Tutankhamun, then that is in a context where it could not be seen. So these pictures are doing something else in addition to representing something. They, they have a function, um, and the function outweighs the representation in some ways, but in others it probably doesn't. It must have been important that the representations could be like the originals or could give you a perfect human form or something of that sort. And it, here we can also think about the general context. So that um, inverted triangle there gives you the, how you might think about things from the most general context. You arrive at a temple at the top or a tomb. You then go towards the structure and you see a whole wall, but you're too much, uh, you're overwhelmed by the amount of content you see. And so you move to look at a bit of it, a register, and these registers themselves have a lot in them. So you look at a scene within the register, and then you might look at an individual figure or element. Uh, well, that's um, surely how designers have to work from the beginning. They have to think about the whole context. But um, if you're going to build up a tradition, you need to work in the other direction from bottom to top of that diagram. Now, I'll try to exemplify this with some examples. 
Uh, so here you have a complete wall in the tomb of Ptah Hotep. It's a very schematic drawing. And that is organized by the two very large figures of the owner and the inscriptions above. And then you have many sub-registers of activities shown. He is looking at these activities. That's what the captions, both those large captions say. Uh, but the organization of what happens in detail is all at the level of detail. And uh, obviously, you can't make a direct connection between the major figure and the minor ones, but you can make lots of indirect connections. And we'll see another example of that in a minute. Uh, now, I'm going to enlarge that element there. And here it is, a photograph. And this has um, various different levels in it, again, largely conveyed by the captions. Uh, so the top of those three registers, uh, sorry, all three of those three registers say seeing. So the seeing is actually written above the figures, but it relates to the tomb owner seeing things. And what is important, which is clear from the bottom two registers, not from the top of the three, is that this is a statistical exercise because you have lots of figures given, particularly for the birds at the bottom. And uh, these figures are quite fantastic. But uh, what is important in terms of organization and meaning is the splendor of the cattle of, and of the birds and their, uh, their organization. And so you've got a very strong ideological message which comes. You can also see how carefully this is done so that the upper register of cattle have rather small horns, and the lower register have much bigger horns, and horns are a great marker of significance for cattle. And then you've got this factor that you fill the pictorial space, more or less, pictorial surface, it's perhaps better to call it. And um, so the birds, therefore, are massed in sub-registers or sub-sub-registers because they will fit there. And then you have details which um, convey meaning, uh, in this case, in a humorous way. This is from the far left of the composition I showed you, um, where the man uh, who is seated on the boat is being given a drink. He's a special figure. He's a sculptor. And he um, is enjoying an outing in the marshes. But if you were to try to translate all of that in the picture into a real setting, it certainly would not work. Everyone would fall into the water, and there are many other problems with it. But that doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is that this gives you a way of thinking about how people enjoy themselves and things of that sort. Uh, here is the tomb of Niachnum, which is pretty much the same date as those last images. Um, re Niachnum and Chnum Hotep, it's been reconstructed. It, our exterior areas have, but the interior is quite well preserved. And there is the entrance. And you can see these reliefs as you go into the tomb. Uh, but this essentially gives you the same point as I was saying about the man in the boat, that what is represented there is an expression of an ideal. It's not meant to convey any literal reality. And you've got two ways in which that's true. One is the very small boat, the difference in, together with the difference of scale between the protagonist, the man, and his wife and children who are on the boat at much smaller scales. And then his subordinates are shown on registers. Uh, this is true on both sides, um, on sub-registers. And these are people who are present in some sense in the in the, uh, the scene. Now, we'll get a detailed example of the type of um, clever treatment that we have in a case like this later on. And then we, going back to the point about whole walls and so on, here we have a whole tomb. The tomb of Nefer and Kahai is just next to Neachnum. And you've got the view out from the interior of the tomb to the outside world. And we have color images of this. That is the wider back end of the room. It's to the 
right of the picture here. Uh, and then you've got the angle across to the wall you saw in the first place there. So you can see how extremely elaborate the composition is and how to put it together um, is to do with con conveying meaning and also setting up cult areas, while the pictorial elements are conveyed in very complex ways, which we'll give you with just one example. Here is the, the left-hand wall as you go into the tomb, the right-hand wall in the first picture, and uh, that is the arrangement of the scenes on it. Uh, now, you have to remember that if you go into an Egyptian tomb, it's pretty dark, and so that's why that scene very slowly becomes visible. And you have, as we had before, a large figure of the tomb owner, top left and far right. And the right hand one is with his wife. Uh, and they are observing the scenes. Uh, that is with uh, illuminated in full. Uh, these are black and white pictures from an earlier publication. And um, uh, how far anyone ever saw it looking like that is a very open question. And there are the registers which organize the, uh, the composition, and they are treated very inventively. <clears throat> so you have here the, this group of people who are netting fish, and they are composed into nearly symmetrical arrangements. So exactly how that works is less important for the composition than the way it's arranged. Uh, then you've got how to link the tomb owner with what's happening. And that man there does that because he is um, at a miniature scale, but he's facing the tomb owner and he is said to be the steward and mortuary priest. So he's a person of high status. Now, here is another part, <clears throat> a different view of the further along the wall, showing you how uh, you have uh, sub-registers of people uh, who are first fording water, that's uh, the lower of these two upper sub-registers, and then um, harvesting papyrus. Papyrus plants are very tall, so you are actually in the register above to pull out the papyrus plant. And if you look at those cattle that are emerging from the water, their legs are actually painted in a kind of impressionistic way through the zigzag of the water, which I can't tell from this photograph, may be carved in relief, whereas that's in paint. We have one or two other examples of that, but it's quite rare. Right, so those are ways in which you can organize things in one or two details, but let's think about the sort of problems that people like Schaefer in particular discussed. How far are they really problems? Uh, you have these pictures of furniture, of which there are large numbers in the tomb of Hesi Re, which is the oldest tomb that has a reasonable amount of decoration surviving. Now, there's one prehistoric tomb, but we will omit that one. And so you have beds here. Now, early Egyptian beds had only two legs, uh, so that you sloped, you wouldn't have needed a pillow to rest on them. And um, you see uh, a section below, and then you see the surface of the bed above. But the surface of the bed is, uh, as we might say, bent, uh, so that it shows you the slope in both of the two renderings that you have there. I think that makes perfect sense, but it should not be taken literally. But this way of treating the surface of, of a bed as well as its base uh, is known from a much later period, and here it is, uh, where you have a scene uh, in which the queen has just given birth, uh, the left-hand figure, and her, her baby is being nursed. Uh, actually, there are two representations, um, and uh, they are apparently sitting on the surface of the bed. But the surface of the bed is both shown as a line, as a register line, you might say, and as a slatted object. But that probably is an archaism because uh, we have evidence which was not known 
um, even a decade ago, that this scene, uh, this composition actually is very ancient. And it might not have gone the whole way back to the Third Dynasty, but it probably we did go back to the old kingdom. So people would have used very traditional forms to represent this mythical event. There are other examples in uh, Hezi Ray, again, showing you similar things. We don't need to pause on them. But the same sort of question is raised by these much later pictures here. Um, and so you have here... Um, a representation of a palace at Amarna. And in this case, there's no one way to understand the organization. Uh, you could draw out what you see there as a ground plan, and you would have on the right a courtyard with a gate to enter it, and then it would have a portico, and the portico is shown both as a projection with a pair of columns and also in a full view with the opening for the entrance. And the, there appears to be a colonnade around this courtyard, so there are two more registers showing these columns. All that's a little bit uncertain, but it wasn't meant for us to try to reconstruct it from the picture, so that's okay. Then, uh, to the left, you have a large hall, and that hall is supported by columns, which are shown very tall, in fact, the whole height of the drawing. But that doesn't mean that there were they were super height columns. It means that fits the composition. Then you have sub-registers of what is present in that hall, which is mainly food. And you have pictures of doors. I didn't comment on the last group. And through that hall, you go into smaller rooms at the back. So there's a clear progression from court to major hall, to uh, smaller rooms. But that doesn't explain the top left-hand feature, uh, which has two elements to it. There's a bed with an enormously large mattress. And then above it is this um, sloping element. And that is a profile of a roof. So Egyptian uh, areas would face north, and they would get the north wind through a um, an opening in the roof, which would bring the cool draft down into the room. So that works in a number of different ways, and there's no use in trying to say which is the correct way or anything like that. But the composite gives a tremendous amount of information about an idealized palace, a quite small palace. Now, the lower pictures here are very different because what they show is palms around a pool. And you would, uh, on the left, you also have trees, other trees. Uh, and so the pool is shown very much like a hieroglyph. And uh, the left-hand one is slightly less inventive than the right one. The right one is um, the pool is between two rows of palms, but they all have their roots at the same point. And that shows you that there are palms um, on either side of the pool, but it's made into what you could almost call an ideogram or something. But it's very clear, I think, in what it conveys. It's just that there is no literal way to understand it. Uh, these conventions are nearly universal, and you, you can see them in this Korean image of the 19th century, which shows the birthday um, of King Sunjo. Uh, and uh, the key area is the, um, the, the area of this enormous tent in which uh, things are happening. Uh, and so, again, if you were to try to work that out, it would be very difficult, but it is a mixture of ground plan and elevation uh, in various ways. If you take, I hope you can see this, I think you can, my cursor there, that is probably a ground plan of some sort of a dais on which many things are standing, and so they're shown in plan. And up here is where the king would be sitting, but you can't actually show a Korean king, so you have an empty throne. Uh, certain other elements are a bit um, a bit more um, 
natural from the Western perspective. There is you know, a certain degree of foreshortening and so on in the trees and the landscape elements, but this is the end of a very long tradition. Then on the left, you have something which is rather ancient Egyptian. That's a list of all those who were present at this event. Uh, and so it's a bit like having the captions you get in Egyptian compositions. Here is another um, reverting actually to just um, a decade or two after the uh, 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 after the Amarna Palace. Here you have uh, something which is very common in many artistic traditions. On the left, there was a picture of Tutankhamun, lost, who was receiving Haramhab, his second successor as king, and um, Haramhab is shown twice, <clears throat> once facing towards Tutankhamun, making a very strong gesture of holding his hand up, and then on the right, he's shown facing towards some foreigners who are petitioning the king. And uh, if you look at much medieval European art, you will find that this fusion of successive uh, stages into a single picture is common. Uh, so the Egyptians don't do that actually as much as some other traditions do, but they can do it when they want to. Here is an example of a slightly exceptional uh, picture, which has two features. One, uh, I'm talking about this bovid in the picture here. Uh, so uh, for some reason, uh, the convention is very far from its normal one. The animal has a nearly human shape of eye. But eyes are fantastically important because eyes are what draw people's attention. And so that's why they're, they tend to be overscale. You can see that on the human figures there. Then, um, the, for some reason, this beast's nostrils are very important and they're shown in something a bit like a plan. Uh, there are, this is not unique, but it's very rare. But then the most puzzling feature, people mostly think, are those three elements hanging down from the animal's neck. Those are rolls of fat, because a very fat animal carries prestige, and that's been made schematic to show you that this is a very fat animal. But if you didn't know a bit of the background, you wouldn't see how that worked. It certainly it looks more like a sort of schema than a picture. Here is another example, again, Chinese in this case. This was used by Schaeffer of a, uh, a bovid uh, where what is important is the way that the, the um, head is configured. Again, emphasis on the eyes and in this case of the open jaw. We're back to our donkey here and we're going to have yet another example. So uh, how are we going to deal with that? Well, I think I'll just move straight along and we can come back to the other example. And I think you see this will tell us something. Uh, this donkey is very sober in the way it's represented. I think the simple explanation is that the second basket is thought should be thought of as hanging down on the other side of the donkey. But that is not the only possible one. Here is the counter example. This donkey is very heavily laden and it's complaining. You don't often see figures with their mouths open, but this donkey has its mouth open, so it is making a noise. And it is uh, in the amount in the pannier is so great that it actually goes above the figure of the donkey. So that really gives you both aspects of the other picture, and it also brings it to life enormously. Well, now I'm going to consider types of object which are not easy to depict. Uh, and um, square objects that have depth don't have an easy way into uh, a form of representation, which is basically uh, concerned with giving you profiles. So the the box on the left will not have an easy picture. The one on the right is distinguished by the shape of its lid. And you, you have, therefore, to think about what the distinctive feature of something is. Uh, if you were an ancient Egyptian, you would know what boxes and special boxes looked like, but we don't. Well, we, and we're lucky in this case because we have these. <coughs> so there are <coughs> sorry two examples of how you 
represent uh, something very similar. On the left, you have the two knobs, which are used to put string around to tie the lid, and then it would be sealed with a mud seal. And at the same time, you've got the fact that the profile um, rises at the front, uh, which you can see actually in the photograph on the right more easily than on the left. The other picture shows you a profile from the front, which, as you can see, is very similar to the picture top right. And so you've got different solutions to how to represent the same sort of thing in those pictures. And here are similar pictures being carried, uh, similar uh, pictures of people carrying boxes. And those boxes are very close in style to what we've just observed. But you can also see here how people are trying to think of the way to include as much content as possible in this picture of a funerary procession. Uh, another different point comes in this example here, where a scribe is writing on, I think that's going to be a wooden writing board, and so it's represented as rectangular, so that you can see he has both his scribal palette here and the board on which to write. But there's another feature of the composition which is very worth singling out, and that is this: if you draw a line like this, you can see that this curve of the figures showing their deference to the scribe is made into a part of the composition. And this means that this kneeling man is actually much bigger than the others. You cannot take the scale literally. Uh, let's pass over the, that one, um, and because time is moving on. Uh, here you have um, a picture of a bird. Now, the Egyptians knew a tremendous amount about birds and understood their wings in extraordinary detail. So that bird is shown both with its closed wing, uh, that's this element here, and with an open wing to show you the, the, the underwing feathers. And there, there are plenty of examples of that sort of thing. Other traditions um, address that sort of problem in different ways. So there are Japanese paintings of the 19th century showing another, you another way to do that type of thing. Um, and then if we think about how compositions are organized, if we were to go back to Asterix at the beginning, some uh, comic writers make play with the different scenes and one scene can act on another scene. So similarly, in this case, you have these two registers which bring together the dedicator of the stealer, he's in the lower register, and the figures to whom it's dedicated in the upper register, and uh, the palm links them while also giving you a sort of context of the, probably this is meant to be the um, edge of the of the floodplain near Dara Medina at Thebes. Here you have somebody who opens a box and in it is another box. Uh, and that other box it has a parallel from the tomb of Tutankhamun. We do really have something looking like that. You can also show the content of a box by uh, giving the just a profile without a solid um, side, and that's what's happening on the right there, a much older picture. How to lay out a building, and, and, or in this case, a, a, a structure within a garden. You, and here, what is important is the different types of trees that are present, the pools, the vines, and all of this are made into a, an organized image. Uh, what the actual orchard of Amun looked like, we have no idea, but um, this image conveys an extraordinary amount of information. Here, to come back to that fishing scene that we saw early, you can see that in the early case, you had a kind of heap of water in which the fish were being speared. In this case, you've got another solution to that issue, which is that the speared fish are held up and they are against a background of bits of water, which are um, just in space. 
Uh, and uh, the point of this is that if you were to show this in a literal way with the spear down into the water, you could not have a suitable picture of the tomb owner. So it's combining different temporal phases of an operation while also giving the tomb owner suitable dignity. Here is a very different thing where you have somebody who is getting water out of a pool. It's the, the figure who's leaning forward, who, who is most amusing to look at, because his leg wraps around the back of a tree. But that could only be true in a picture, not in reality. Uh, another way to think about this problem of organizing compositions, as I said earlier, Egyptians like to fill their pictorial surface. The right-hand image doesn't fill it very densely, and it also mixes writing and image you know, with a very heavy bias towards writing. That's a matter of status. In, at an early date, uh, people didn't have much in the way of images. They tended to have more writing, and so that's writing heavy. The left-hand image, much later date, is much more pictorial. But then if you're going to fill a register with offerings, now, what are you going to do? So you have these green mats that separate sub-registers showing piles of offerings, but there's no way to understand any of this literally. Uh, it has to be seen as a way to represent vast numbers of offerings within a tightly defined space in the tomb, on the tomb wall. Uh, I think I'd better um, be very quick here. Uh, you've, this is a way to show how you thresh an abundance of grain in the upper picture. And the, the grain is so deep that the, um, the hooves of the animals threshing are hidden in it. And it's also so deep that a man on both sides can stand on top of it. Don't take this literally. Here you have new methods being developed for showing massed figures. Um, this is maybe a generation, no, it's about the same date as the last example. You've got in the upper seat register here, uh, two sets of bovids, and um, also probably top right calves filling a gap. And then you've got people who are layered vertically near the bottom there, and the birds where they are just a mass of heads, which you couldn't line up with the legs. All of that is a, a development which is using the surface to maximum extent. And this, a couple of generations later, under Ramses II, or more, more like three or four generations, you have the same in order to represent the Egyptian army uh, at Kadesh. And in this case, you can see that the probably the model from which this was designed was different. Because if you look at the bottom of the picture, there is a clear gap between the bovids next to the chariots in the upper sub-register and the horses below, but there is no register line. So it has been turned into something which is supposed to be a more open representation. And those open representations can be paralleled, because here you have uh, the idea of the low desert in the left picture with the detail. Um, and then you've got many, many registers which are meant to show the dense habitation of the city. And then here you have a military camp, so more like what we saw a moment ago. And there you've got um, meandering register lines to make sure that you can use the entire pictorial surface to give as much content as possible. Uh, now, I'll be as quick as I can now. This is a famous image, uh, a cartoon, which uh, comes from the New Yorker uh, and shows, uh, well, how did ancient Egyptians learn to draw? The answer is certainly not like that. Uh, people would learn from models of drawing, but the models of drawing showed a deep understanding of the proportions of the human figure, slightly odd. Recording in progress. Are designed to face right. Uh, and um, when they face left, you have to make compromises and you will realize that this man has a right hand on a left arm. And that's needed in order for him to be holding the correct things. 
uh, similar points here. Let's skip that. Uh, modern copyists have had problems here um, because if you look at that 19th century copy, it doesn't actually show what the original has because that was counterintuitive to the copyist. There is a more correct drawing, drawing, and what you should look at is the feet of the forward of those two standing servant girls. So this is a rare example of somebody who's kind of shown from the back. Um, but her feet were not shown that way, uh, and that's simply that the feet were done in a more conventional fashion. You can you could write a whole book about feet if you wanted to. And there is a photograph to show that the second copy is the correct one. And modern artists have then taken up this and you have this whole book <clears throat> which shows uh, photographs of models trying to look like ancient Egyptians, uh, which uh, they've been remarkably successful in this. How much Photoshop has improved the figures, I'm not sure. And uh, so you've got various takes on an ancient Egyptian figure here. And you can, this figure here is useful to look at because this, the pectorals of the man are represented, which of course they never are for men in, in Egyptian art. So at that point, the modern artist really couldn't uh, deal with the conventional character of Egyptian art. He was not focused enough on the profile, you could say. Another example there. And art historians can be misled by this, I think. So here you have a very unusual Egyptian picture um, where somebody is again shown more or less from the back um, dealing with this oryx here. Um, and sorry, when I say an oryx, I'm probably wrong about the species. Uh, and then um, an art historian, David Summers, has tried to make this into a sort of diagram of the layers in the picture. But I don't think the Egyptians would ever have thought that way. I think that's using a modern way of understanding depth and things like that in a context where it's not relevant. And that is a problem cartoon creators have used. So uh, dead white, white European males were a typical term of abuse for European males about 25 years ago, but perhaps you still know that uh, way to talk about it. But the Egyptians themselves then thought about these same problems. So here is an example of what we do with depth and what would that mean. Now, these scenes in which people are shown netting birds, the crucial thing is that one man is hiding, and he's hiding in order to give a signal to the people who are going to close the net who are some way away. This uh, can only be understood if you've seen lots of these pictures or seen the thing happening in, it, uh, in reality, because this is a tiny composition. So uh, that where are we going to put the hiding man? Well, we're going to put him behind the picture. So here is a kind of pictorial joke. Uh, with which I'm going to end this talk, showing you that everything that the Egyptians are doing, they're doing it very deliberately. So thank you for your patience, and I will leave a blank screen to indicate I've finished. So I'm ready for questions if anyone has any. I've stopped the screen. Well, I've stopped my projection now. I'll keep my share on in case somebody wants to go back to a picture. But perhaps we've lost something. I'm not sure.
I have a question here. It says, if ancient Egyptian art has similarity with the Asian art, do you think ancient Egyptian artists could express their own artistic personalities in their art products? Uh, that's a very interesting question to which I don't think there's a simple answer. Uh, I think in the case of Chinese art, uh, in Chinese painting, there is a strong cult cultivation of the person of the artist. And Chinese paintings are things that individuals can carry out. That's not the situation we have mostly in Egypt, where uh, the works that we have are the product of group work. Uh, so you would have a whole studio of people who are grinding the pigments, laying out the wall surfaces, plastering them, and doing all these tasks which are needed to create a painting or to carve a relief. Somebody is designing the whole thing, and that person can be thought of as the master artist, let's say. Uh, but uh, big, uh, the art is very conventionalized, and it doesn't probably s show the same degree of individuality as Chinese painting does. But um, I think uh, we should certainly think of the person who is in charge as being an artist. And similarly, uh, if you're dealing with uh, with carved work, with stone carving, which is much more laborious as a process, but uses the same principles, then again, you have somebody who is in charge. Now, you have to remember that a Chinese painting is something that is done uh, and really became an, an aesthetic object which did, uh, had clear importance in the culture, but didn't have a religious importance or something of that sort, or not much. Uh, in the case of ancient Egypt, most of the material we have is all material that was in tombs and places like this where it had a clear religious significance. And so I wouldn't expect such a strong sense of individuality. But nonetheless, uh, if you, that last example gives you a case where somebody is really taking um, up the, the tradition and trying to produce a new meaning and a new composition from it. Uh, now, I've got another related question here. The Ptahotep tomb images, in particular the one showing the sculptor being entertained, I believe it was quite unusual for the artist or sculptor in this case to be portrayed in a scene, an unusual way to get credit for his work. Now, that's an interesting question um, because uh, there are a few examples like that one, not very many. And uh, what you have to think is if you are designing an enormous wall of a tomb, uh, and this the tomb is very important for the tomb owner, uh, if you were to put a picture of yourself into it without the owner knowing, that wouldn't work. So we have to assume that this is something that is agreed between the tomb owner and the sculptor. And we've got um, various pieces of evidence that show that sculptors, and that also means people making statues, uh, were particularly uh, favoured in the Old Kingdom context anyway. And so uh, I think that uh, it, it, it is partly an unusual way to get credit, but it was part of a uh, of a of an institution in which uh, this was done. But nonetheless, the number of examples is very small. I hope that answers that one more or less. It's a very good observation. Um, now, uh, the next question, I'm afraid, I don't really understand. Uh, the question is, do you believe in the relation between ancient tracts and Egypt? What do you know about Bastet and Bulgarian temple? Now, Bastet is the Egyptian uh, uh, cat goddess, also lioness goddess, and she was definitely uh, one of the Egyptian deities who was spread to the Eastern Mediterranean. But I'm afraid I don't know anything about Bulgarian temples, and um, that's that's a, a different sort of topic from uh, from that of my lecture. 
Uh, but undoubtedly, there was a major influence that went from ancient Egypt to the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, to as far east as um, Mesopotamia, and also in the first millennium BCE uh, throughout the Aegean and um, ultimately to the Roman world. And uh, it's possible that um, it's more than possible, very likely, that some of this also happens in Bulgaria. But I'm afraid I'm not informed about that. I'm sorry. Uh, as far as I, uh, I don't see any more questions. Does anyone else want to say anything? Uh, good evening, Professor. Can you hear huh? me? Uh, yes, I can, I think. Yes. I'd like to ask a question, but before that, uh, I'd like to congratulate you on this wonderful presentation. Well, thank you uh, very and much. Since my focus is language. I was wondering if you could, if I could make the assumption that ancient Egyptian uh, alphabet has actually influenced art to some extent due to the shape and the economy of of uh, spatial features presented in an image. Thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a very complicated question, I think. Um, uh, Egyptian uh, art was sort of designed to work with writing. Uh, and um, uh, I gave you a couple of examples where they, uh, they interact and uh, it's, it, it's very, very widespread. Uh, but um, the strict Pictorial representation, how you show a figure, is not in itself determined by writing. Uh, and um, you you have plenty of examples where there isn't anything inscribed, but it still works in a similar way. Uh, if you have hieroglyphs, they are pictorial also. They use basically the same conventions. But in practice, almost always, in a mixed composition of writing and image, you can tell the two apart. I think that's deliberate. People don't want to confuse the viewer. But although they don't want to confuse the viewer, what's in the what's written is complementary with what is shown in the picture. And a simple example of that will be if you have a picture of a man who is wearing very specific clothing and holding something like a stick or a scepter, those images are understood by everyone as conveying his status and his role. But in addition to that, um, a good example would be that Tahotep one. You have the titles that the two Mona held, <clears throat> which are listed above the figure, and, and just a selection of them. And those give you information that could not be conveyed pictorially. And so the two are working together to produce the composition. Uh, but uh, I think I would say that hieroglyphs um, are developed more and more for their pictorial aspect. But the, and uh, so when you get to the Greco Roman period, it's particularly exploited in new ways. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the Egyptians are basically wanting the, to keep these two areas working together, but visibly a bit different from each other. Uh, uh, one more exception that is worth mentioning is cases where the Egyptians uh, give uh, represent only parts of figures. So in the pyramid texts, inside pyramids and on coffins, you often get uh, a human figure hieroglyph is represented only by a head and the arms or something like that. And that seems to mean that uh, there would be um, a, a worry that if you were to have a full figure and you would then bring it to life magically in the next world, it could be harmful. And so you neutralize the figure while still conveying the same content in the text. Uh, so that's a kind of intermediate case. And this, again, has many parallels in the rest of the world. And you can think about how people erase inscriptions because they don't like their content. They're doing something similar an ancient Egyptian in that case. I hope that's helpful.
Uh, dear Professor Baines, thank you for your wonderful lecture. I hope that you raise many questions that uh, must be answered in the next uh, some kind of seminar or another lecture. Uh, okay, well, the, the area in flesh, not uh, only online. Yes, thank well, you. online has its disadvantages, thank you definitely. Our event. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank the audience for uh, all the audience for having come here. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor. Bye, see you. Благодаря ви на всички, които се включихте и в Zoom, и на Zoom. Thank you very much, dear colleagues.